Some things are in our control and others not. Things in our control are opinion, pursuit, desire, aversion, and, in a word, whatever are our own actions. Things not in our control are body, property, reputation, command, and, in one word, whatever are not our own actions. The things in our control are by nature free, unrestrained, unhindered, but those not in our control are weak, slavish, restrained, belonging to others. Remember then, that if you suppose that things which are slavish by nature are also free, and that what belongs to others is your own, then you will be hindered, you will lament, you will be disturbed, and you will find fault both with gods and men. But if you suppose that only to be your own, which is your own, and what belongs to others, such as it really is, then no one will ever compel you or restrain you. Further, you will find fault with no one and accuse no one. You will do nothing against your will. No one will hurt you, you will have no enemies, and you will not be harmed. Aiming, therefore, at such great things, remember that you must not allow yourself to be carried even with a slight tendency towards the attainment of lesser things. Instead, you must entirely quit some things, and for the present postpone the rest. But if you would both have these great things, along with power and riches, then you will not gain even the latter, because you aim at the former too but you will absolutely fail of the former, by which alone happiness and freedom are achieved. Work, therefore, to be able to say to every harsh appearance, you are but an appearance, and not absolutely the thing you appear to be. And then examine it by those rules which you have, and first and chiefly by this. Whether it concerns the things which are in our own control, or those which are not. And if it concerns anything not in our own control, be prepared to say that it is nothing to you. Remember that following desire promises the attainment of that of which you are desirous, and aversion promises the avoiding that to which you are averse. However, he who fails to obtain the object of his desire is wretched, and he who incurs the object of his aversion more wretched. If, then, you confine your aversion to those objects only which are contrary to the natural use of your faculties, which you have in your own control, you will never incur anything to which you are averse. But if you are averse to sickness, or death, or poverty, you will be wretched. Remove aversion, then, from all things that are not in our control, and transfer it to things contrary to the nature of what is in our control. But, for the present, totally suppress desire. For, if you desire any of the things which are not in your own control, you must necessarily be disappointed. And of those which are, and which it would be laudable to desire, Nothing is yet in your possession. Use only the appropriate actions of pursuit and avoidance, and even these lightly and with gentleness and reservation. Men are disturbed not by things, but by the principles and notions which they form concerning things. Death, for instance, is not terrible else it would have appeared so to Socrates. But the terror consists in our notion of death, that it is terrible. When, therefore, we are hindered, or disturbed, or grieved, let us never attribute it to others, but to ourselves, that is, to our own principles. An uninstructed person will lay the fault of his own bad condition upon others, 
someone just starting instruction will lay the fault on himself. Someone who is perfectly instructed will place blame neither on others nor on himself. Consider when, on a voyage, your ship is anchored. If you go on shore to get water, you may along the way amuse yourself with picking up a shellfish or an onion. However, your thoughts and continual attention ought to be bent towards the ship, waiting for the captain to call on board. You must then immediately leave all these things. Otherwise, you'll be thrown into the ship, bound neck and feet like a sheep. So it is with life. If, instead of an onion or a shellfish, you are given a wife or child, that is fine. But if the captain calls, you must run to the ship, leaving them and regarding none of them. But if you are old, never go far from the ship, lest, when you are called, you should be unable to come in time. Sickness is a hindrance to the body, but not to your ability to choose, unless that is your choice. Lameness is a hindrance to the leg, but not to your ability to choose. Say this to yourself with regard to everything that happens. Then you will see such obstacles as hindrances to something else, but not to yourself. If you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid with regard to external things. Don't wish to be thought to know anything, and even if you appear to be somebody important to others, distrust yourself. For it is difficult to both keep your faculty of choice in a state conformable to nature, and at the same time acquire external things. But while you are careful about the one, you must of necessity neglect the other. Let death and exile and all other things which appear terrible be daily before your eyes, but chiefly death. And you will never entertain any abject thought, nor too eagerly covet anything. If you wish your children and your wife and your friends to live forever, you are stupid. For you wish to be in control of things which you cannot. You wish for things that belong to others to be your own. So, likewise, if you wish your servant to be without fault, you are a fool. For you wish vice not to be vice, but something else. But if you wish to have your desires undisappointed, this is in your own control. Exercise, therefore, what is in your own control. He is the master of every other person who is able to confer or remove whatever that person wishes either to have or to avoid. Whoever then would be free, let him wish nothing, let him decline nothing which depends on others else he must necessarily be a slave. You may be unconquerable if you enter into no combat in which it is not in your own control to conquer. When, therefore, you see anyone eminent in honors or power or in high esteem on any other account, take heed not to be hurried away with the appearance and to pronounce him happy. For if the essence of good consists in things in our own control, there will be no room for envy or emulation. But for your part, don't wish to be a general or a senator or a consul, but to be free. And the only way to do this is a contempt of things not in our own control. If you ever happen to turn your attention to externals so as to wish to please anyone, be assured that you have ruined your scheme of life. Be contented then in everything 
with being a philosopher. And if you wish to be thought so likewise by anyone, appear so to yourself, and it will suffice you. Don't allow such considerations as these distress you. I will live in dishonor and be nobody anywhere. For if dishonor is an evil, you can be no more engaged in evil by the means of another than be engaged in anything base. Is it any business of yours, then, to get power or to be admitted to an entertainment? By no means. How then, after all, is this a dishonor? And how is it true that you will be nobody anywhere, when you ought to be somebody in those things only which are in your own control, in which you may be of the greatest consequence? But my friends will be unassisted. What do you mean by unassisted? They will not have money from you, nor will you make them Roman citizens. Who told you then? that these are among the things in our own control and not the affair of others. And who can give to another the things which he has not himself? Well, but get them then, that we too may have a share. If I can get them with the preservation of my own honor and fidelity and greatness of mind, show me the way and I will get them. But if you require me to lose my own proper good that you may gain what is not good, consider how inequitable and foolish you are. Besides, which would you rather have, a sum of money or a friend of fidelity and honor? Rather assist me then to gain this character than require me to do those things by which I may lose it. Well, but my country, say you, as far as depends on me, will be unassisted. Here again, what assistance is this you mean? It will not have porticos nor baths of your provided. And what signifies that? Why, neither does a smith provide it with shoes. It is enough if everyone fully performs his own proper business. And were you to supply it with another citizen of honor and fidelity, would not he be of use of it? Yes. Therefore, neither are you yourself useful to it. Useless to it. What place, then, say you, will I hold in the state? Whatever you can hold with the preservation of your fidelity and honor. But if by desiring to be useful to that, you lose these? Of what use can you be to your country when you are become faithless and void of shame? If you are struck by the appearance of any promised pleasure, guard yourself against being hurried away by it. But let the affair await your leisure and procure yourself some delay. Then bring to your mind both points of time, that in which you will enjoy the pleasure and that in which you will repent and reproach yourself after you have enjoyed it. And set before you in opposition to these how you will be glad and applaud yourself if you abstain. And even though it should appear to you a seasonable gratification, take heed that its enticing and agreeable and attractive force may not subdue you. But set in opposition to this, how much better it is to be conscious of having gained so great a victory. It is a mark of want of genius to spend much time in things relating to the body, as to be long in our exercises, in eating and drinking, and in the discharge of other animal functions. These should be done incidentally and slightly, and our whole attention be engaged in the care of the understanding. When any person harms you, 
or speaks badly of you. Remember that he acts or speaks from a supposition of its being his duty. No, it is not possible that he should follow what appears right to you, but what appears so to himself. Therefore, if he judges from a wrong appearance, he is the person hurt, since he too is the person deceived. For if anyone should suppose a true proposition to be false, the proposition is not hurt, but he who is deceived about it. Setting out then from these principles, you will meekly bear a person who reviles you. For you will say upon every occasion, it seemed so to him. Everything has two handles, the one by which it may be carried, the other by which it cannot. If your brother acts unjustly, don't lay hold on the action by the handle of his injustice, for by that it cannot be carried, but by the opposite, that he is your brother, that he was brought up with you, and thus you will lay hold on it as it is to be carried. Whatever moral rules you have deliberately proposed to yourself, abide by them as they were laws, and as if you would be guilty of impiety by violating any of them. Don't regard what anyone says of you, for this, after all, is no concern of yours. How long, then, will you put off thinking yourself worthy of the highest improvements and follow the distinctions of reason? You have received the philosophical theorems with which you ought to be familiar, and you have been familiar with them. What other master, then, do you wait for to throw upon that the delay of reforming yourself? You are no longer a boy, but a grown man. If, therefore, you will be negligent and slothful and always add procrastination to procrastination, purpose to purpose, and fix day after day in which you will attend to yourself, you will insensibly continue without proficiency, and living and dying, persevere in being one of the vulgar. This instant, then, think yourself worthy of living as a man grown up and a proficient let whatever appears to be the best to you be to you an inviolable law. And if any instance of pain or pleasure or glory or disgrace is set before you, remember that now is the combat. Now the Olympiad comes on, nor can it be put off. By once being defeated and giving way, proficiency is lost. Or, by the contrary, preserved. Thus Socrates became perfect, improving himself by everything, intending to nothing but reason. And though you are not yet a Socrates, you ought, however, to live as one desirous of becoming a Socrates. The condition and characteristic of a vulgar person is that he never expects either benefit or hurt from himself, but from externals. The condition and characteristic of a philosopher is that he expects all hurt and benefit from himself. The marks of a proficient are that he censures no one, praises no one, blames no one, accuses no one, says nothing concerning himself as being anybody or knowing anything. When he is, in any instance, hindered or restrained, he accuses himself. And, if he is praised, he secretly laughs at the person who praises him. And, if he is censured, he makes no defense. But, he goes about with the caution of sick or injured people dreading to move anything that is set right, before it is perfectly fixed. He suppresses all desire in himself. He transfers his aversion to those things only which thwart the proper use of our own faculty of choice. 
the exertion of his active powers towards anything is very gentle. If he appears stupid or ignorant, he does not care. And, in a word, he watches himself as an enemy and one in ambush. In every affair, consider what precedes and follows, and then undertake it. Otherwise, you will begin with spirit, but not having thought of the consequences, when some of them appear, you will shamefully desist. I would conquer at the Olympic Games, but consider what precedes and follows. And then, if it is for your advantage, engage in the affair. You must conform to rules, submit to a diet, refrain from dainties, exercise your body, whether you choose it or not, at a stated hour, in heat and cold. You must drink no cold water, nor sometimes even wine. In a word, you must give yourself up to your master, as to a physician. Then, in the combat, you may be thrown into a ditch, dislocate your arm, turn your ankle, swallow dust, be whipped, and, after all, lose the victory. When you have evaluated all this, if your inclination still holds, then go to war. Otherwise, take notice, you will behave like children who sometimes play like wrestlers, sometimes gladiators, sometimes blow a trumpet, and sometimes act a tragedy when they have seen and admired these shows. Thus you too will be at one time a wrestler, at another a gladiator, now a philosopher, then an orator. But with your whole soul, nothing at all. Like an ape, you mimic all you see, and one thing after another is sure to please you, but is out of favor as soon as it becomes familiar. For you have not entered upon anything considerately, nor after having viewed the whole matter on all sides, or made any scrutiny into it, but rashly and with a cold inclination. Thus some, when they have seen a philosopher and heard a man speaking like Euphrates, Though indeed, who can speak like him? Have a mind to be philosophers, too. Consider first, man, what the matter is, and what your own nature is able to bear. If you would be a wrestler, consider your shoulders, your back, your thighs. For different persons are made for different things. Do you think that you can act as you do? and be a philosopher, that you can eat and drink and be angry and discontented as you are now. You must watch, you must labor, you must get the better of certain appetites, must quit your acquaintance, be despised by your servant, be laughed at by those you meet, come off worse than others in everything, in magistracies, in honors, in courts of judicature. When you have considered all these things round, approach, if you please. if. By parting with them, you have a mind to purchase apathy, freedom, and tranquility. If not, don't come here. Don't, what, like children, be one while a philosopher, then a publican, then an orator, then one of Caesar's officers. These things are not consistent. You must be one man, either good or bad. You must cultivate either your ruling faculty or externals. You must apply yourself either to things within or without you. That is, be either a philosopher or one of the vulgar. The beginning of philosophy. To him, at least, who enters on it in the right way and by the door is a consciousness of his own weakness and inability about necessary things. For we come into the world with no natural notion of a right-angled triangle, or of a diesis, or of a half-tone. But we learn each of these things by a certain transmission according to art. And for this reason, those who do not know them do not think that they know them. 
but as to good and evil, and beautiful and ugly, and becoming and unbecoming, and happiness and misfortune, and proper and improper, and what we ought to do, and what we ought not to do, whoever came into the world without having an innate idea of them. Wherefore, we all use these names, and we endeavor to fit the preconceptions to the several cases thus. He has done well, he has not done well, he has done as he ought, not as he ought, he has been unfortunate, has been fortunate, he is unjust, he is just. Who does not use these names? Who among us defers the use of them till he has learned them, as he defers the use of the words about lines or sounds? And the cause of this is that we come into the world already taught, as it were, by nature some things on this matter. And proceeding from these, we have added to them self-conceit. For why, a man says, do I not know the beautiful and the ugly? Have I not the notion of it? You have. Do I not adapt it to particulars? You do. Do I not then adapt it properly? In that lies the whole question, and conceit is added here. But now, since you think that you properly adapt the preconceptions to the particulars, tell me whence you derive this. Because I think so. But it does not seem so to another. And he thinks that he also makes a proper adaptation. Or does he not think so? He does think so. Is it possible, then, that both of you can properly apply the preconceptions to things about which you have contrary opinions. It is not possible. Can you then show us anything better toward adapting the preconceptions beyond your thinking that you do? Does the madman do any other things than the things as in which seem right to him? Is then this criterion for him also? It is not sufficient. Come then to something which is superior to seeming. What is this? Observe, this is the beginning of philosophy, a perception of the disagreement of men with one another, and an inquiry into the cause of the disagreement, and a condemnation and distrust of that which only seems and a certain investigation of that which seems, whether it seems rightly, and a discovery of some rule, as we have discovered a balance in the determination of weights, and a carpenter's rule in the case of straight and crooked things. This is the beginning of philosophy. Must we say that all things are right which seem so to all? And how is it possible that contradictions can be right? Not all, then but all which seem to us to be right. How more to you than those which seem right to the Syrians? Why more than what seem right to the Egyptians? Why more than what seems right to me or to any other man? Not at all more. What then seems to every man is not sufficient for determining what is. For neither in the case of weights or measures are we satisfied with the bare appearance. But in each case we have discovered a certain rule. In this matter, then, is there no rule certain to what seems? And how is it possible that the most necessary things among men should have no sign and be incapable of being discovered? There is, then, some rule. And why then do we not seek the rule and discover it and afterward use it without varying from it, not even stretching out the finger without it? For this, I think, is that which, when it is discovered, cures of their madness those who use mere seeming as a measure and misuse it, so that for the future proceeding from certain things known and made clear, we may use in the case of particular things, the preconceptions which are distinctly fixed. 
what is the matter presented to us about which we are inquiring? Pleasure. Subject it to the rule. Throw it into the balance. Ought the good to be such a thing that it is fit that we have confidence in it? Yes. And in which ought we to confide? It ought to be. Is it fit to trust to anything which is insecure? No. Is then pleasure anything secure? No. Take it then and throw it out of the scale and drive it far away from the place of good things. But if you are not sharp-sighted, in one balance is not enough for you, bring another. Is it fit to be elated over what is good? Yes. Is it proper then to be elated over present pleasure? See that you do not say that it is proper. But if you do, I shall then not think you are worthy even of the balance. Thus things are tested and weighed when the rules are ready. And to philosophize is this, to examine and confirm the rules. And then to use them when they are known is the act of a wise and good man. When I see a man anxious, I say, what does this man want? If he did not want something which is not in his power, how could he be anxious? For this reason, a lute player, when he is singing by himself, has no anxiety. But when he enters the theater, he is anxious, even if he has a good voice and plays well on the lute. For he not only wishes to sing well, but also to obtain applause. But this is not in his power. Accordingly, where he has skill, there he has confidence. Bring any single person who knows nothing of music, and the musician does not care for him. But in the matter where a man knows nothing and has not been practiced, there he is anxious. What matter is this? He knows not what a crowd is, or what the praise of a crowd is. However, he has learned to strike the lowest chord and the highest. But what the praise of the many is, and what power it has in life, he neither knows, nor has he thought about it. Hence he must of necessity tremble and grow pale. I cannot then say that a man is not a lute player when I see him afraid, but I can say something else, and not one thing, but many. First of all, I call him a stranger and say, this man does not know in what part of the world he is. But though he has been here so long, he is ignorant of the laws of the state and customs and what is permitted and what is not, and he has never employed any lawyer to tell him and to explain the laws. But a man does not write a will if he does not know how it ought to be written, or he employs a person who does know, nor does he rashly seal a bond or write a security, but he uses his desire without a lawyer's advice, in aversion, in pursuit, in attempt, in purpose. How do you mean, without a lawyer? He does not know that he wills what is not allowed, and does not will that which is of necessity. And he does not know either what is his own, or what is or what is another man's. But if he did know, he could never be impeded. He would never be hindered. He would not be anxious. How so? If any man then afraid about things which are not evil? No. Is he afraid about things which are evils, but still so far within his power that they may not happen? Certainly he is not. 
If, then, the things which are independent of the will are neither good nor bad, and all things which do depend on the will are in our own power, and no man can either take them from us or give them to us if we do not choose, where is room left for anxiety? But we are anxious about our poor body, our little property, about the will of Caesar, but not anxious about things internal. Are we anxious about not forming a false opinion? No, for this is in my power. About not exerting our movements contrary to nature? No, not even this. When, then, you see a man pale, as the physician says, judging from the complexion, this man's spleen is disordered, that man's liver, so also say, this man's desire and aversion are disordered. He is not in the right way. He is in a fever. For nothing else changes the color, or causes trembling, or chattering of the teeth, or causes a man to sink to his knees, or shift from foot to foot. When some persons have heard these words, that a man ought to be constant, and that the will is naturally free and not subject to compulsion, but that all other things are subject to hindrance, to slavery, and are in the power of others. They suppose that they ought, without deviation, to abide by everything which they have determined. But, in the first place, that which has been determined ought to be sound. I require tone in the body, but such as exists in a healthy body, in an athletic body. But if it is plain to me that you have the tone of a frenzied man, and you boast of it, I shall say to you, Man, seek the physician. This is not tone, but the opposite. In a different way, something of the same kind is felt by those who listen to these discourses in a wrong manner which was the case with one of my companions who for no reason resolved to starve himself to death. I heard of it when it was his third day of abstinence from food, and I went to inquire what has happened. <laughs>